This is EHJ today at uh, the Cardiology Update in Davos, Switzerland. And I'm uh, Thomas Lüscher, uh, Editor-in-Chief of the European Heart Journal, and I'm talking to you, Calkins from uh, Johns Hopkins University, where he's Professor of Cardiology. Welcome you. Well, thank you very much. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, catheter ablation uh, of uh, ventricular uh, tachycardias or arrhythmias. Now, traditionally, these uh, are considered very dangerous uh, um, arrhythmias, potentially life-threatening, and uh, any doctor is uh, concerned about it. And so, we, first of all, how would we handle this in general, and when would we uh, start to consider catheter ablation? Well, when, when you think about ventricular tachycardia, there's two big types. There's mm -hmm idiopathic VT in PVCs, where someone has a structurally normal heart, a normal EKG, normal echo, and it's really a benign arrhythmia that causes symptoms. It can cause palpitations or lightheadedness or even syncope. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have very frequent PVCs, more than like 20%, it can cause a cardiomyopathy. But that kind of VT, catheter ablation, is a first-line therapy. You can go in, cure it with catheter ablation, it's not life-threatening, you don't have to worry about a defibrillator. So that's sort of one story. And the other story is the other type of VT that occurs in patients with structural heart disease mm -hmm. that's life-threatening. You know, many patients or most patients get a defibrillator. Anyway, and, huh? Anyway, yeah. and catheter ablation, sort of a, you know, to prevent defibrillator shocks mm -hmm. or to prevent AT therapies or to replace antiarrhythmic drugs. But catheter ablation in structural heart disease is sort of palliative therapy. It's sort of a quality of life issue. It doesn't protect you from sudden death, you know, but it's still very important. So in the idiopathic uh, form, uh, how, how, do, how do you go about uh, to perform a catheter ablation? How does this work? Well, it, it, it works where you, you bring the patient to the EP lab. As long as you can start up the VT or you can start up the PVCs and they're coming from one place, Basically, with the tools and, and mapping techniques we have today, we can get to wherever that place is, deliver RF energy that's basically a marble-sized lesion, and these are focal arrhythmias, and by doing that, you can cure the patient. You know, most come from the upflow tract to the right, right ventricle. Some come from the aortic root or the uh, left posterior fascicle, but wherever they come from, as long as you have a target, you can start it reproducibly up in the EP lab, you know, we can use our you know, GPS, you know, 3D mapping systems, find the spot, cure the patient, and it's a very rewarding, uh, really terrific procedure that really got developed in the early 90s as soon as RF ablation showed up on the scene. So uh, you stimulate the heart, uh, you, you induce uh, PVCs, and uh, how sure are you that you actually then trigger the arrhythmia that the patient usually has? Because if you have very aggressive protocols, you may also induce arrhythmias that may not reflect uh, the ones that the patient has, can't you? Yes, I mean, it's important always to make sure you have the clinical VT documented, ideally by a 12 lead, yes. before you get into the EP lab. Then you know what, how it would look like. And, the, and, and then you know, and you use program stimulation, but also isoproteranol infusions, mm -hmm. very, very important. Mm -hmm. And many of these are triggered or automatic, and so they come out with an isoproteranol infusion. And I think where the procedures don't work well is if you have a patient who has infrequent PVCs like 2,024 hours, you bring them to the EP lab with a little sedation, the PVCs disappear, and then there's nothing you can do, and, 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 and that's not a good patient. What right. you want is a patient with 20,000 PVCs or someone where you can you bring them to the EP lab, you can start up, you know, sustained VT with isoproteranol, and you have a really good target. And uh, what's the success rate? Oh, I'd say the success rate is you know 90 plus percent, yes. and that's both acute and long-term cure. Once you are successful, it's like WPW, you're cured for life. Yes. If you get past the first one or two month post ablation, mm -hmm. you know that's it. Yeah, and now let's talk about the other forms of uh, arrhythmias. Uh, usually, patients with uh, structural heart disease or post infarct that have uh, lots of arrhythmias uh, have an ICD. So when would you uh, select uh, catheter-based ablation and how would it work there? Yeah, I mean, the first issue is obviously risk stratifying them for sudden death and figuring out if they need a defibrillator mm -hmm. because no one will claim that catheter ablation reduces risk of sudden death. Uh, and then if you have a patient who has an ICD and who's having recurrent VT, 
then usually you'll try antiarrhythmic drug therapy first, you know, sotalol, you know, possibly amiodarone, something like that. If that fails, you know, they're having repeated shocks, then you'd think about catheter ablation. Certainly in a patient where amiodarone has failed, then you have, you know, your best antiarrhythmic drug has failed. You don't really have many other options. And the real question is, should we be doing it, you know, first line? Someone has an infarct, gets a defibrillator, they have a first episode of VT, should we go in and do catheter ablation then? And that's really what all the current trials are looking at, where we don't have any comparison data of risk and benefit and long-term outcome. Right, yeah. And amiodarone has quite a couple side effects, particularly after some duration of treatment in my experience and also uh, when you look at the literature. So this is an important clinical question, but it's unresolved right now. I mean, I think in a young person, you know, if someone's in their 80s, that's one thing, but if they're in their 50s or 60s, we generally try to avoid, you know, amiodarone in those For patients. Decades. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the other, the other problem we have these days is all the P labs are filled up with AFib ablation. Right. <laughs> so these patients show up at the wrong time, you know, and the labs are full. And yeah. so then too often, it's so easy just to put them on amiodarone yeah, yeah. and not, you know, bring them to the lab. You know, they're long procedures, they're hard procedures. Right. So I think that's a problem too. So let's, let's assume it's a patient after infarction. Uh, how, how do you get about uh, the... Uh, this arrhythmia in this patient. Yeah, so if someone, you know, they have, they're post-infarct, they're having a recurrent VT, you're gonna do a VT ablation. I mean, first, we'll do imaging. We like to do MR imaging, although sometimes the- To see the scar. To see the scar, and that can be very helpful. And then you bring them to the lab. You know, the first question is, is the VT you induce hemodynamically stable? Mm -hmm. Which it rarely is. If it is, then you have the luxury of mapping it. Sure, yeah. You know, find the critical isthmus, try to burn it during the VT, terminate it, and that's what we really love. Mm -hmm. But most of the time you get in there and their blood pressure goes to nothing and you have to use substrate-based approach mm -hmm where you look for scar, low voltage areas, yeah, you yeah. pace map to see if you're close to the exit site, yeah. and then you basically, we call it homogenizing the scar. You basically burn all the scarred areas and hope you're getting rid of any live tissue that's sitting there in between the scar. But it's a, it ends up being a fairly you know, aggressive you know, procedure with lots of ablation, and uh, you know, the results are good, but they're certainly not great. So what, what is the uh, cure rate, more or less, or the success rate, let's call it this way? I mean, it really depends on how you define exactly. success. Mm -hmm. And that a little bit depends on what time it is in the day and how tired you are. Mm -hmm. But you know, complete success, if the patient is completely non-inducible with aggressive stimulation, you can induce nothing. You'd say that's a you know, home right. run, great right. success. Right. A clinical success is their clinical VT, you can't start up again, but you may have other VTs. Right. So that's sort of partial success. But the humbling thing is, that so it ends up, depending on the definition of success, the acute success is 50 to 75%. About half the patients Good. completely non-inducible, 75%, you got the clinical VT. Mm -hmm. And then what's a little bit sobering is if you look over the next year, there's about a 50% of those patients will have recurrent VT, mm -hmm. and about t 10 to 20% will die of either cardiac or non-cardiac right. causes. But these are often patients with heart failure, yes. and, and so it's a it's a group that does you know that you got to keep following. It's not we don't use the term cure. Yes, and the last uh, group just to finish up maybe quickly, uh, uh, cardiomyopathies, ARVC, is yeah. an option too. Yes, I mean, certainly ARVC is a, you know, is a, you know, I think, very important arrhythmia where catheter ablation of VT, particularly epicardial ablation, is really playing a more and more of an important role. I think our current data you know, suggests about a 70% success rate at one year, which I think is quite respectable. The other arrhythmia that we never imagined would be treatable with catheter ablation is Brugada syndrome. Right. And so we, not Amani, uh, discovered a technique where you ablate in the outflow tract or epicardially in the outflow tract, mm -hmm. and you can normalize the Brugada EKG, nice. get rid of that R prime and that early right. repolarization, and it seems to be very effective in preventing recurrence. So who would have guessed a sodium channel defect? Right. You go in there, treat it with catheter ablation. Well, that's an exciting new area, and thank you very much for sharing it with us. Well, thank you very much for the invitation.